We're here with internationally recognized author, speaker, sex therapist, licensed clinical social worker, Wendy Maltz. Welcome to Thriving Launch with Louise Congdon and Kamala Chambers, the show for heart-centered entrepreneurs who want it all. Five days a week, we bring you different segments to inspire you to live a life of freedom. We interview the leading experts in the field of business, health, and love. Be sure to check out Training Tuesdays, where we give you a clear action plan to grow your own business. Maybe you can relate to this. When I was a full-time coach, keep repeating the same things to people over and over and over again. And it got to be kind of draining and I wasn't really enjoying what I was doing anymore. So what I decided to do was record the things that I had to tell clients over and over and over again. And then I packaged those recordings together and sold them as an online course. If you're interested in creating and selling your own online course, head over to thrivinglaunch.com and I have a free training for you on how to create and make passive income through your own online course. One of the books she wrote is one that we're particularly interested in today. It's called The Sexual Healing Journey, a guide for for survivors of sexual abuse. Welcome, Wendy. Well, thank you for having me. It's really great to have you on the show. You know, one of the things that we're really committed to is getting couples top resources for their relationship and sexual abuse, sexual recovery, traumas is a topic that's not discussed as often as I think we should discuss it. So we're really excited to get you on the show. I want to ask you, Wendy, what inspired you to write a book? I mean, uh, about this subject, it's such a big subject matter and writing a book is just a long and arduous process. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, there's such a big need in terms of uh, help for survivors who are encountering sexual problems. And this book, The Sexual Healing Journey, is actually a classic recovery book. It's been been around for a while. I mean, I have this new revised edition of it from, uh, you know, just 2012, I think, or 2013. And um, But it's been around for 20 years, so it start, you know, I started writing it when I was a young therapist who uh, was seeing a lot of people in my practice I was trained as a sex therapist and just shaking my head and going, how come standard sex therapy exercises don't work with these people? And uh, what can be done? And what do they need? How can it didn't just didn't seem fair that people who were encountering who had encountered sexual abuse, men and women, you know, were having difficulty with sexuality and that they weren't able to uh, heal with with the kinds of strategies and techniques that were out there. I'm also a survivor myself, and so I wasn't mm. even encountering problems in my own marriage and going, you know, and really going, this needs to change, and people need to be more aware of the problem so they can recognize them and make a connection and go, oh, the reason I have so much low sex desire is because I have these negative associations with sex that, you know, started out from abuse, things like that, or sexual functioning problems that related to abuse. I'm really so, uh, curious yeah. what you consider sexual abuse and what's considered sexual abuse, because maybe that can start to click in people's minds you know, oh, wait, that is something I've experienced. Yeah, um, it's pr- a pretty broad definition. It has to do with exploitation, when somebody exploits or dominates another person uh, for sexual activity or uh, suge- with sexual activity or suggestion. So, you know, it can involve so many things. It can involve child sex abuse, incest, molestation, date rape, marital rape, sexual assault, uh, voyeurism, obscene phone calls, gender attack, even gay bashing, and sexual harassment. You know, it it, it goes the full gamut. But there's usually a betrayal of trust, and that's one of the factors that can go on. 
and a um, a lack of consent and using sex as a way to harm someone or control someone instead of experience mutual pleasure with them you know, at an appropriate age. Mm. What do you find the most helpful to help people start to find healing from sexual abuse? Well, I think a lot of people start out really in the dark with uh, what's going on with them because there are lots of repercussions of an intimate nature that they might not have identified our signs of having been sexually abused, of our problems that, that occur, like they might avoid sex or be afraid of it or approach it as an obligation or feel out of control with it and have compulsive sexual interests and desires, unwanted fantasies too, or functioning problems. And um, so being able to, to bridge and make that connection and go, oh, you know, I'm encountering some of these problems that are associated with sexual abuse. Maybe that that thing that happened to me or those things that happened to me um, in the past could, are having an effect on what's going on. So it's sort of a light bulb thing of going, I've made the connection. And then, you know, it's learning about the different uh, steps to recovery. And, and those are outlined in the sexual healing journey. And... uh being, you know, it, it goes from changing attitudes about sex to changing behaviors and learning new approaches to touch. Uh, and it's possible. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize that they can make great progress in terms of reclaiming their sexuality as something healthy and positive uh, for them. They they think they're damaged goods or that they uh, somehow you know, are bad for what they participated in or so, what went on. You know, yeah. talking about that, because I mean, what you're, what I really get from what you're sharing is that a lot of people feel shame and have a lot of hard, have a very hard time opening up about the subject. I know that personally, the reason why I sought you out is because I was seeing a, a lot of clients, uh, women, for a while that were coming to sessions by themselves without their partner. And as we dove deeper into what was going on for them, sexual trauma and abuse kept coming up over and over. And I would ask, have you talked to your partner about this? And, you yeah. know, as a relationship coach, people come to me because they want help on their relationship. And what I found across the board with all these women is they were having this certain issues. The issues varied, but really it came down to a sense of I can't open up completely to my partner or we're not having the relationship that we want. And at some point I would find out that there was this big secret that their partner yeah. didn't know. And one of the things I found is that I really needed to help them be able to open up with me about it so that they could move forward and maybe eventually open up to their partner. And my question is, as a male partner, because sexual trauma is more common in women, that doesn't mean men don't have it, but as a male, how can I help my partner begin to open up? Um, you know, making it safe, believing what you're told, uh, be having compassion and understanding, recognizing that we live in a society where there is a great deal of sexual abuse goes on, and most women experience it in some form. In terms of criminal forms, you're looking at like uh, one in three or one in four women experience uh, sexual uh, assault and 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 uh, abuse that you know could be uh, where there's a, an actual sex offender, a criminal sexual offender involved. So you know it's it's out there, it's everywhere, it's in subtle ways. It's um, and and being able to have empathy and create a safe place to to talk where they're believed and. Also, to help the woman to feel that she can gain control in terms of what goes on intimately to encourage mutual behavior and not to uh, dominate uh, force or, you know, or cajole for sexual activity, uh, try and understand what are some triggers and, and work together. It's all about learning how to work together as a team 
when partners learn about sexual abuse, they read books like The Sexual Healing Journey, which has a whole chapter for partners, or some of the books like Allies in Healing by uh, Laura Davis, and uh, there are a number of um, resources for partners. I have some uh, DVDs uh, that are really helpful partners in healing so, things like so this. here's a question so I, you, you learn about it and then you don't you know make mistakes in terms of trying to address it in ways that are counterproductive so here's a question i have for you when i've talked to men who have discovered that their partner was and now this is just assume, you know talking about heterosexual couples right now in this moment but when i've mm-hmm. talked to my male friends who have heard from their partner that she was abused, many men tend to feel a sense of retaliation. They want to hurt the person that did that to the person that they love. They feel angry. And oftentimes what I found is that that doesn't help. Uh, You know, as much as me as a male would want to defend, you know, my partner or go back in the past or find that person who did it and, and beat them up or, you know, make them feel some sort of pain, I've found that women don't tend to respond too well to that. Is that true in your experience? Yeah, because it sort of jumps over the whole issue of what they're feeling and it goes into, you know, this mode of trying to get back at the perpetrator when the abuse might have happened years ago. And, uh, I mean, it's an understandable reaction. I remember working with a couple when the woman had... um, been abused by her father and the her young husband had knew the father and went on some to sporting events together with this father and heard that the father had been inappropriate and um, but didn't hear the details of the abuse until they got into counseling well when he heard the details of the abuse which involved things like oral sex and and you know other direct touched uh, he got so upset he um jumped up on the side of the couch and uh he was started to uh, to vomit and you know or he said he was about to vomit he ran down the hall to the bathroom and then he came back and he said i'm going to kill the guy Hmm. and uh so it took you know quite a while to just calm things down and for her to share with him that that would be totally unproductive and he's missing a point what she needed in that moment was not to hear that her father you know was going to be killed and her dear husband would go to jail or you know <laughs> for life or whatever but she needed to, to to hear him say i'm so sorry that happened to you and what can we do together to uh, address this you know so dealing learning how to deal with his own anger which was justified but uh, keeping the focus on the survivor and the survivor's needs hmm. is so important. Yeah, when I was a teenager, I was raped and I had a boyfriend who found out about it and he attacked the guy and ended up getting bitten by a dog while he was attacking the guy who did this to me. And, you know, had his, he has a scar for life because of that. And I, I felt actually worse from that experience of having him, you know, lash out to the person who had done that and then him getting hurt. I just, you know, I felt so much, I felt more shame around him doing that. Yes. And uh, so that's another example. So keeping that focus on what is the survivor experiencing and what is she needing um, in terms of help but getting some help for himself, a male, or if it's a female partner, getting help for themselves to deal with the understandable anger reactions they have and feelings of powerlessness. It really is, uh, in some ways, so, you know, it can be helpful for a survivor to hear, wow, what happened to me was really significant, you know, and shouldn't have happened based on this reaction. So a little bit of it can be productive in, in terms of you didn't deserve this. You didn't do anything wrong that this happened to you. You know, those kinds of messages. You know, one of the things that I'd really like to point out for the listeners, especially the men, is how important that piece is of we're actually being counterproductive to our desire to help if 
we show this great amount of anger and the sense of we want to attack that person uh, and have this vengeance. It's completely normal and natural if you're a male and you're hearing the story and you feel sadness, you feel anger, you feel upset towards that other person. And to tell your partner, wow, I'm really upset to hear this and that must have been really hard for you. And doing a redirect where you're putting the attention back on your partner and what his or her feelings were. And the idea is that they're not, if the survivor can hear, gee, I'm not alone. Mm-hmm. I have somebody who cares about me and will do healing work with me. That is the, a really healthy place that, to direct the energy. Yeah, I, I'm i really curious that, you know, that's like I just told you that I was raped. It's not something that I've told that many people and now all our listeners hear it and I'm just curious, what is, you know, if you have that secret or you have something that you may have considered sexual abuse, what should you do with that? Uh, Well, you know, finding, to start with finding safe people to talk with, like in a therapy context is a, you know, is a good place to start um, with a trusted relative or friend Uh, With a sexual assault treatment center, you can make a phone call. There's a national organization called RAIN, R-A-I-N-N, and and you can go to RAIN.org, and there are people that you can talk with. Just, I think, breaking that silence is so important. Don't carry the shame. The shame belongs to the perpetrator and, I think, to our culture, which um, fosters a lot of ideas and sort of roles that um, make sexual abuse possible and policies that make sexual abuse possible. So, you know, needing to look at it in the bigger context, too, that it wasn't you it's, you know, this is something that's going on and is happening to a lot of people as well. And so you don't have to take the shame on for it. Uh, I think when, you know, I always tell survivors that when they start feeling a little angry about what happened to them, you know, and the anger bubbles up instead of it, the shame can just kind of flip and goes like, hey, this wasn't right that this happened to me. Hey, I'm really upset that this happened to me. And it's sort of that anger can be uh, uh, really good in terms of mobilizing them to seek help and to join a survivor support group or, you know, to read books on um, sexual recovery and sexual abuse recovery and join the online support services, things like that. And, you know, this shouldn't have happened to me. I want to stop it from happening to other people, too. Uh, that energy is a great thing, and, and you learn to have compassion for yourself. And, you know, sometimes survivors will blame themselves for something. They'll go, oh, well, I shouldn't have drunk so much at that party, or I shouldn't have worn that outfit, or they'll, they'll you know, I, I, sh- I shouldn't have gone with that uncle. I knew he had a problem or something like this. But it's like, no. You should be able to wear whatever, go whatever, be whatever, and not get sexually abused. It wasn't you. It's a problem in our culture and problem with the person who did this. Yeah, it's something that can be really easy to kind of numb out or forget about or try to sweep under the rug. And I found that in my own journey, too, and I see that in my clients' journeys. And sometimes... When the issue comes up again and kind of rears its ugly head and, and those memories start flooding back or the, the body memories start flooding back is actually when you're in the, the act of sex and when you're in a space yeah. of, of safety and you're with your partner who loves you and then those body memories can start to come back and that pain and that trauma. And one thing that has been really helpful for me and guiding other people through their recovery process is slowing down, giving spaciousness for those feelings to come up and just letting them be there and just breathing with them and holding the body. And rather than, you know, if those those sensations start coming up, they get uncomfortable. Maybe you want to start thrusting faster to try to override those feelings and just try to focus on the sensation of getting off. And I think that slowing down is one of the key pieces 
for letting those feelings be there and not needing to figure them out in the moment. I'm curious about, you talk about sexual healing. What's one of the key pieces that you get into when those traumas come up while you're being sexual? Well, I think it's really interesting what you just said, Kamala, that because you're spot on. I mean, it, it, you have to kind of go through them, but in a different, go through an experience in a different way and not try and override it because it will just come back. Uh, In terms of steps for recovery, there are things of, you know, creating new meanings for sex, improving your sense, your sexual self con um, concept, realizing your body's not bad, you're not bad, and and you're not damaged goods, things like that. Identifying automatic reactions um, and things that trigger those kinds of flashbacks you described. Stopping negative behaviors because sometimes survivors can act out in ways that are harmful to themselves or others when they're confused based on the abuse. Um, being able to relearn touch in a way, sometimes even taking, I recommend like something called a vacation from sex where you actually stop having a genital sex, you know, for a while and work on developing some skills like being able to be present in intimate touch, being able to breathe and relax to associate touch with feelings of respect and caring and being able to communicate in touch and the whole series of relearning touch exercises which are in the video uh, relearning touch techniques you know though and they're described in the book too you can go on my website and learn about them to mm-hmm. go on healthysex.com but you know th- those are just marvelous 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 in terms of giving people experiences where they can slowly move forward on their own or with a partner to experience a new approach to uh, pleasurable touch that's related to sexual touch. You start out with non-sexual and then move into sexual. So sometimes it works with just making the kind of adjustments you were talking about, slowing down and and allowing yourself to process feelings. But um, uh, uh, other times that you may need to just pull back from it all and kind of give yourself a rest and then start anew with uh, approaching sex in a different way. You know, as I'm, I'm listening to both of you, one of the things that comes up for me and the audience of men is how do I approach my partner if I find out that she's been sexually abused? How do I approach her with sensitivity and touch and how do I slow down and learn how to listen to her? What should I be doing? And I would love to hear from both of you. Well, it's like, don't feel, don't take, don't set the agenda and don't take over what's happening. Be available, have a positive energy, uh, applaud small steps, ask and, um, you know, like, are you open to touch now or let me know, you know, and check in with the partner during touch experiences or uh, like I said, educate yourself about the different steps uh, that are involved in sexual healing, but don't take over the recovery process and don't pull on the partner to do more than the partner's ready to do. And uh, so you're available, you're positive, you're not, you're, you're realizing that for a while, that survivor is going to need to feel she's in control of what goes on in terms of physical uh, activity and then later you can work towards more mutual initiations or or your being able to initiate uh, some things when she feels safe when she's made some changes uh, so it, it really is being able to be present and positive and um, encouraging mm, I absolutely love everything you just said and completely agree with it. I think from my recovery experience, I didn't even touch on the pain of it until years later when I actually finally felt safe enough to feel Mm -hmm. the pain of it. And um, I think a big piece is asking permission 
you know, that that was a that was a big piece at the beginning of my healing journey. And in, in workshops, I've just seen women just bust open and start to really relax when someone actually asked permission of how if, can I touch your body? Can I touch your body like this? How would you like to be touched? And that alone can be so healing because, yeah. you know, if, if a body is used to just being touched and however the man wants to touch it, then it can be so damaging for the woman. So creating that safety yeah. through that is really powerful. Yeah, you did. That's so true. And you don't want, as a partner, you don't want to recreate any kind of dynamic that's similar to how the perpetrator behaved. So it's sort of like a, a rule of thumb there. It's like uh, do the opposite of what went on in the abuse. There was no choice in abuse. You know, have lots of choice. You know, the other person pressured. Uh, don't pressure. You know, it's like so you do, you do the opposite, and uh, and it's understandable. This is really tough stuff for partners uh, to get. And it's crazy making because you can have, I see in my practice all the time, some of the sweetest partners, guys, and even in lesbian relationships, it, you know, you see the same thing. It, it doesn't, it crosses the sexual orientations. Um, and you can have this, the sweetest partners and the safest partners. And it just is that because they want to be sexual with the person who's the survivor, they are going to inadvertently trigger um, some negative reactions. And being able to not take this personally, you know, I mean, as a partner, you don't want to say, well, how come you don't see me as safe? Have I ever, uh, you know, abused you and things like that? It's like, no, you just got to understand that the more the survivor is able to, her sharing with you that she's having some problems is and you're being able to hear that and take that seriously and make adjustments, that's where the healing's going to occur. A person can't snap out of an automatic reaction and say, oh, I'm no longer scared of you. Yes, you are a safe person. It's something that has to be learned through uh, new physical and emotional interactions with each other. Wow, it's all such great stuff. I'm curious if you would say anything different to male survivors. In terms of what their needs are, I think it's, you know, being a male survivor also can be a challenge because they're, it, it's hard for men to admit that they are having problems. And a lot of times the sexual repercussions from abuse will show up in terms of like some compulsive sexual behavior or heavy involvement with pornography or um, you know, isolating into uh, masturbation or, and, uh, or having some uh, functioning difficulties that come up with erectile dysfunction. And, you know, it's, it's just a little harder in our society for men to admit some of these things. But, um, uh, I, th I think that having a partner who's not pressuring them and a partner who, um, you know, is works willing to work as a team with them on the healing process. That's similar, and that's where the progress is made. Mm. That's that's really great to hear that you know Kamala asked that question because it was something that was on my mind. Is there a difference? And really, to me, it doesn't sound like there is. I mean, there's this kind of this myth around men and women being so different. And while yes, there are many differences. In a lot of ways, we're so similar too. We're, we're all wired, you know, in so many different ways in regards to how we recover, how we feel loved, how we feel safe. And the process in a lot of ways is, you know, going to be pretty much the exact same process as making that person feel yeah. safe, connecting with them and letting them know that they have value and that what happened in the past does not in any way impact how you feel about them. Yes. And it does not have to define them. Um, yeah, it's all, I think that I, I heard some kind of quote once. It was something like, we are harmed in, in relationships with other people and we are healed in our relationships with other people, you know. <laughs> and, uh, it, I really think love is stronger than abuse. I say that all the time. 
because I see it in the, you know, in the counseling with what couples are able to accomplish when people really care about each other and, you know, and they convey feelings of respect and, and compassion. It's just, it's amazing what goes on. And you don't have to let what happened in the past be the last word. Mm, that's I, I love that. And one of the things that I want to touch base on that we haven't is that for anybody that's interested in Wendy's work and really learning about sexual recovery and healing, as well as porn addiction or any subject really relating to relationships, Wendy has a great website, healthysex.com. And I also want to add one more plug because one of the things that we can't really completely touch base on in this type of platform of just audio is how do we relearn touch and how do we do that? And if you go to her website, she has a program called Relearning Touch, Healing Techniques for Couples. Wendy, it's been really fantastic to have you on the show. Really, really appreciate it. This is the most important topic that I can think of to put out there that's not talked about enough. So I really value how you're showing up in the world and, and putting these resources out there for people Thank you. I really appreciate it. And uh, just for listeners to know you're not alone if you or in, within your couple relationship are experiencing these concerns and that, that there is help. You've been listening to the Thriving Launch Podcast. For books and resources related to today's episode, make sure to head over to thrivinglaunch.com. We'll see you there. Be sure to listen to our next episode where we have a very special guest, millionaire mind creator, T. Harvecker, New York Times bestseller, T. Harvecker. And he's going to teach you what is a millionaire mind and how can you wire yourself for millions and millions of dollars. 